The next group that were seen by some as pirates were the privateers. Privateers were basically pirates with government support. Countries like France and England would hire sailors to attack the Spanish ships since they couldn't trade. They would give the sailors an official document that made the attacks legal. Still, they were free to attack any ship belonging to another country. Whatever treasure they found was then split with whatever government had hired them. For piracy started out as far more illustrious, a feature of British imperial policy. As early as the 16th century, English ships carried letters of mark, entitling them to attack, loot, sink, or capture ships belonging to all enemy nations, France, Holland, Portugal, and Spain. Especially Spain. For such piracy was economic warfare. This was the period when the Caribbean was the Spanish lake, which was looked on by English sailors the way a lion looks on a herd of wildebeest. In effect, England licensed certain merchant captains to become lions. They called them privateers. It amounted to sanctioned plunder, a profitable if dangerous vocation. But one man's privateer is another man's pirate. How could you control a whole generation of well-trained privateers whose greatest weapon was their independence? The answer was, you couldn't. Eventually, the privateers realized they could make more money if they just kept everything for themselves. They still avoided attacking their own ships at least for a while. Spain realized that if they opened up the main for other nations, there would be no reason for them to hire privateers. So, they didn't poof. The privateers were unemployed. That didn't stop them, though. They just decided that now they were free to steal from any country they wanted. They became pirates. One of the most famous privateers was Sir Francis Drake. He was what you might call an unofficial privateer. He had no license from his home country of England, but he never attacked English ships. He mainly attacks only Spanish ships. Some believe he was taking his orders from England from the very beginning, but they didn't make it public because they didn't want a war with Spain. In fact, we do know now that in 1577 the Queen of England herself was paying Drake. He was an amazing sailor. One of his trips lasted over three full years and ended up circling the globe. It takes six weeks, but Drake battles his way through the straits and emerges into the relative calm of the Pacific. No English ship has done this before. Conquering the straits gives him the one feature sought by every pirate since Drake. Sudden and overwhelming surprise. For weeks, he ravages the South American coast, falling upon one unsuspecting ship and town after another. And then, on March the 1st, 1579, Drake comes upon the fattest of Spanish treasure ships, the Cacafuego. Cacafuego is a major warship, and twice the size of the Golden Hind. Ordinarily, such an attack would be considered suicidal. And so here, Drake uses the second trick in every pirate's kit. Deceit. What Drake does is he throws out a number of loaded wine jars full of water to slow him down, and crams on full canvas, and starts moving towards the Cacafuego. And while the captain is still wondering what the hell is going on, up from the decks of the Golden Hind appear all these armed men, ready to swarm aboard, which they very quickly do. They grapple and get aboard. Cacafuego has no time to fire its guns, no time to arm its men, He's finished. It's a very short, sharp, brilliant engagement, and Drake has taken a superior vessel. 
Upon his return, he was made leader of the English Navy. Queen Elizabeth was very proud of his work and was willing to openly support him. Spain was not happy and invaded England with their massive navy, the Armada. England had only a small navy of fast little ships, yet they were able to win. Drake masterfully led his navy against the large Spanish one using speed and cunning. To this day he is a hero to England, but a criminal to Spain. Amazingly, being a pirate wasn't just about the money. There was a sense of freedom that few other people at the time shared. A democracy is a government where people get to vote. In the time of the pirates about the only place you'd find such a thing is on a pirate ship. It wasn't like most countries where the king ruled with total power. The captains did have some power, but they were elected and could be removed by vote at any time. Even more amazing is that women and people of other nationalities and even kids were treated as equals on the ships. Oddly, because a pirate crew was the haunt of cutthroats and villains, a sort of truce settled over shipboard life, centered around an informal pact. Peace, pistols and cutlass, clean and fit for service. Some pirate voyages started with each man signing such a contract. No striking one another on board, but every man's quarrels to be ended on shore at sword and pistol. No. Every man has a vote in the affairs of the moment. We're dealing with the first democracy in some sense. Every man to be called fairly in turn by list on board of prizes. Meaning everybody gets a proper share. The lights and candles to be put out at 8 o'clock at night. No striking one another on board. If you had a beef, you took your squabble ashore. No man to talk of breaking up their way of living till each had shared 1,000 pounds. Here at last was a real floating republic, every man having a say in his destiny. And when they came to choose a destination, many opted for the Caribbean. The crew voted on things like where to go next and how treasure would be split up. The caption often got a larger share but everyone got something. Normal sailors who weren't pirates didn't get to keep anything. Any treasure they found or trade their captains made went back to the governor. They were paid a set amount and couldn't ever get rich. Pirates didn't have any sense of social class. If you could earn the treasure you got a better life out of it. It was a very different lifestyle from the rest of Europe. There were many negotiable and lucrative commodities trading on the seas. In the 17th and 18th centuries, humans were among those goods. So slavers were valuable ships to intercept. Most slaves were sold on, but some could join the pirate crew. For a black man who was captured by pirates meant that he had a unique opportunity. Because on board pirate vessels, blacks were treated as equals. We know that some blacks were elected as officers and captains of predominantly white crews. Some of the most successful pirates uh, in history were black men. And it's a terrible irony that during the early 18th century, perhaps the most powerful place for a black man in the Western world was the deck of a pirate ship. So, you had a shot at riches and a shot at freedom. So, was the pirate life a good one? Let's find out. Piracy. It's as old as the sea itself. But the pirate legacy has been hijacked by Hollywood and romantic fiction. Pirates, we're told, are faintly noble, selfless independents, toiling for king and country. The real pirate story is much darker. Pirate lives were nasty, brutish and short. Lives that for a brief moment in history terrorized the oceans, demanded the attention of the naval might of Europe, and then sank out of sight. <laughs>